Hello, welcome everyone to this night's broadcast of Exo Metaverse of LightNet. We have our special guest with us, Dwayne Ollinger. He is uh, the star of the Discovery Channel Mystery on Blind Frog Ranch. And he's also really stepping up right now. He's hosting a major disclosure symposium on his ranch, which is 20 miles outside of Skinwalker Ranch. Uh, and it's going to be really exciting. Before we get started, I just want to tell you a little bit about Dwayne and why I'm such a big fan of his. So let's go here to the slides here. So one of the things, and you'll find out uh, tonight uh, about Dwayne, is he's incredibly sincere, and he's incredibly smart, and he's incredibly... Uh, He's on a mission, basically. His curiosity has led him down the ultimate rabbit hole, the ultimate opportunity. And he was chosen of us all. You know, we all have these chosen paths, but he was chosen to really share from his heart some important information that's happening, happened to him. And he's just such a great messenger, so to speak, um, because he's so funny and so lovable and uh, so warm and so inviting. And he has uh, become the owner of Blind Frog Ranch, which has healing properties and all sorts of other mysteries that have been unraveling before his eyes and everybody's eyes who've been watching the Discovery Channel Mystery at Blind Frog Ranch. So again, he's also hosting uh, this UFO Disclosure Symposium. And he and his staff told me, Thanka, you know, we're really getting together all the, the PhDs, the scientists, the experiencers. We've got this new UAP footage that the world hasn't seen. And we want to broadcast it live to mainstream media. At the same time, we're showing it to the people at the conference in Utah. And we're going to have all, you know, the footage has already been analyzed 10 times to, to Kansas, but they're going to talk about it live with all these experts. Um, there's going to be incredible people there. Professor Avi Loeb from Harvard's going to be there. Travis Taylor's going to be there. Um, our very own, um, well, James Keenan is going to be there. Um, and Paul Hynek, our very own Paul Hynek, who's been with us from the beginning in our consortium. So this is a really great opportunity um to go if you can't make it to um vernal utah you can watch it live um and we'll share the links um in the chat there uh for you to check that out uh, if you do go you can it's really fun they're gonna have a really fun experience for people you get to tour the tour the ranch um and do all sorts of things so you can just go to bit.ly uh, slash blind frog to find out more. And if you're new to this, um, we're LightNet. We call ourselves the Hogwarts for Humanity, where we allow people to have experiences that open their mind, whether it's spoon bending or interdimensional radio or seeing a UFO, we're really focused about creating small groups for us to bring in the people that are sort of curious, that are on the fence, that haven't had an experience that's changed their worldview to join us. And uh, so we're kind of family. I want to give a shout out to Alan, who's, who's live streaming this. Um, if you are watching on Alan's channel and you haven't subscribed, go ahead and do that. Same thing with Portal to Ascension. Thank you, Neil, for, for broadcasting. And also Carl the Crusher. Again, if you're watching in one of these channels, please hit subscribe to support their work in the world. Uh, Alan's going to come a little bit later. He's doing a remote viewing broadcast. And he's going to talk about his new contact series. Uh, but now let's get into the heart of the matter. You know, one of the things that we do uh, in our group is um, we do hangouts. So I just wanted to let you guys know if you're watching on the live stream right now, um, we would encourage you to go to lightnet.org slash hangouts so you can get inside the Zoom with us because you're gonna be able to ask questions and you're gonna be able to get into small groups if you choose so later on the broadcast. So again, lightnet.org slash hangouts will get you into the Zoom room. So Dwayne, welcome to this evening's interview. I've just been looking forward to this all week. Thanks, thanks for having me, thank you. <laughs> And one of the things that we do is we document people's contact experience, uh, experiences, because uh, 
they're just so interesting. And yours is one of the most interesting I've ever heard. Uh, and I just wanted to kick that, kick it off with that, um, having you, you talk a little bit about how, how you got involved in all this. Oh my. So, uh, to start, uh, I guess I, I watched my parents die in hospice. And so in turn, I thought, my gosh, there's got to be more out there than this. And so in turn, um, we started looking for alternative uh, medicines and things like that, thinking that maybe there's something that can add to this whole um, picture. Because, you know, if, if our parents die from something, you know, we're kind of in line with that, you know, and so and our children are and our grandchildren are. So why would we? take the time and we had a uh, successful company and, and we just took off on a journey. And the, the biggest deal is that I told um, at that time I was married and I told my wife at that time that we don't care about what the regular medical doctors are saying right now. We want to find out what's weird, different. And, and, and I, I want this on record right now that I didn't have a clue what I was talking about because I, I just didn't have a clue. I mean, things just started coming from out of the woodwork and one guy know another guy and another lady had know another lady and it just got massive. And so what was strange is that everything that they brought to the table, they would prove. And then, so you just can't, excuse me, you just can't, you can't discount any of it. And so in turn, it just opened up a huge uh, scenario of, uh, of different opportunities. And, and we used a lot of that stuff in our company, uh, people that, you know, we, we found out about rife frequencies and, and, and all different types of, of medical devices that, you know, were not very popular back then, but we had people that you know, had hepatitis C from military. Uh, we had people that had cancers, uh, lung problems, and they would they would use these devices and, and they would get better. Um, gosh, oh my, I just can't count the scenarios. And so we started putting on these little um, conferences and just saying, hey, just come and listen. Come and listen to these guys. And we would bring those people in from all over. And uh, they would prove the point, and uh, it was it was such a blessing. And then how we got into this project up there was that uh, we created a group called the Healing Center, and and in that Healing Center there was a bunch of people that knew about this project up there, and they brought it to my attention. They needed probably what you might call a low higher risk contractor, and that's what we do for a living is work in the oil field and refinery. So. It was kind of intriguing thinking that, you know, if all these people here are telling us about this stuff and it's coming true, then why would I discount up there in the mountains? And so, again, we went up there to start that project and, and help with it at the time. And as of right now, we own 66% of the project. So um, what I found out up there is... <clears throat> that I didn't have a clue what I was dealing with. Not one clue. I mean, it just got wilder and you think, well, it can't get any wilder than that. And it does. And so it was so intriguing and, and uh, life changing. Uh, you know, at one time we had over a hundred employees in the, in the refinery and oil field, plus or minus. And uh, once you kind of saw what I saw up there, it, everything that I was doing didn't make sense anymore. Uh, it was just a mind boggling deal to think, you know, what we're trying to move forward here on and what we used to believe in uh, doesn't have anything to do with what, what we're, what we're seeing here. And so that's where it all kind of changed. And, and uh, here we are. I, I don't know if I was answering your question or not. Sorry about that. I can't hear you. Oh, sorry. Yeah. So I guess what you're saying is, is that your mind had already opened up to the fact that things weren't making sense 
like one plus one wasn't equaling two when you saw strange people being healed that were told they're not going to be able to heal. So there was, there was this like crack in your, you know, in your thinking says, hey, wait a minute. And then you get called to do some, some drilling on some land, but then what, what exactly happened? So uh, there was really two sides to that project. One where we were using George Stevens and that's where we found the cave systems. And out of the blue, you know, look, we're from, we're from Texas. We're in the flatlands of Texas. And, and for, uh, for the information to not be huge, we, we uh, uh, a guy from Texas can't go up there on the side of a mountain in Utah nowhere and find a cave system without having high guidance of, of people. And, uh, and George Stevens, he was, he was ex-CIA. He used to do work for, uh, for the Vietnam era where he was, where you or I see uh, 16 shades of gray, he sees 32, and there was five of those guys in the Vietnam era. So in turn, he found out by his training uh, that, that he could also see colors on the, on the trees where if there was precious metals down below, it would change the canopy color of the tree. And, and so he was on the project on, on the west side where we dropped into the cave systems and that's where the blind frogs showed up. And, you know, uh, one guy asked me, he said, my gosh, he said, how do you know they were blind? Well, I knew that he was gonna jack with me a little bit. So I said, look, I held an eye chart up. They couldn't even read the, read the top line. So I'm just saying that uh, the frogs, uh, they would be on the side of the bank and you'd have to watch, walk up and touch them on the nose before they jump. They just had no awareness of, of anything because they'd been in massive dark all their lives, you know, but that meant that there is an ecological system down there that, that is going on. And, and that's where we found out later that uh, we're in the 9,600 feet of flooded caves. That's plus or minus. And uh, where we really got into a, uh, the wilder scenario is we ran into a guy named Don Nikolov, evident footprint. And he was, he was in communication with uh, Jeremiah Davis. Now, I met Don Nikolov up there in Utah in another situation and I liked him, so I hired him for the east side. And he gave us target points. Uh, on the east side to make a dig. And then he gave us two points to drill two holes. And in saying that, uh, it, took, it took a while to, to dig out the ravine to, you know, to get to where we needed to be. And then he gave us those two target points. Well, he was in communication with Jeremiah Davis. And we'll get into that, however you want to get into that. But, uh, um, the, the target points where they told us to drill, they said, now one target point, we need to go down 75 foot with a drilling drilling core. So we call them rat hole rigs. So uh, it's a 36 inch bit that you just drill down and you bring out the sample and you twist it and turn it over there and you throw it away right beside your machine. So at 75 foot on one hole, uh, we didn't hit nothing and, you know, but, but you don't give up on people uh, because of everything that they proved to be true. So um, at from 75 foot to 83 foot, they drilled down and we drilled through this core and then they pulled it up and slung it over. It was the bluest dirt you've ever seen. So, or I've ever seen, let's just put it that way, you know, and so I thought, oh, my gosh, you know, how would these people know where this is whenever this is has to be millions of years ago? Something is just not right. How would they even know this? Because there's there's been no uh, uh, exploration out there, or, you know. And so we moved down to the next one where we had to drill a hole at 68 foot. We, we were told we were going to hit something. And uh, sure enough, we got to 68 foot, nothing. And we drilled through and went through from 68, let's just say the 75 foot, we pulled that core up 
and it was blue dirt. It was just like an echo of a, of a shield of some kind because the dirt was the same on the top. You go through the blue and then the dirt's the same on the bottom. So in turn, whatever took place there, we were being monitored by Jeremiah Davis. And uh, so that night, it was like we gave an energy field air. We just, we just don't know what really took place, but uh, we were told that you just need to know that whenever we drilled through that platform of that blue dirt, that now that whole area, the, the whole mountainside is giving off a blue aura or a blue cloud. And it's also lightning strikes are coming out of the ground about four foot tall. And uh, so that's, that's where it got weird because, you know, I got the call or we got the call from Jeremiah Davis on what was going on. And so we're going out, you know, and, and, but we were told not to go out. They said, no, you just don't understand. Uh, you guys opened up a scenario here and, and, and it's, it's very dangerous. Well, that, that's no answer. Uh, what we do is dangerous. So um, I just told one guy and then Don Nikoloff were going out and, you know, and, and as we were going out, we started having pickup problems and, and it was like the pickup started ticking like a, a bomb. And so we were told to get out of the pickup and, and, you know, and it's a long story as we're getting to the project. Cause it's about 30 miles out there and something was jacking with our, our radio and it was given a, a grown talk through the radio and, things like that, that, yeah, I guess it's probably the first time I ever talked about this one, but uh, it was, it was, you know, and then we were talking on the phone with Jeremiah and he was saying, you guys just don't understand. This is a very dangerous situation. So anyway, we parked the pickup on the side of the road and, and uh, we were down there about a hundred yards down thinking, well, hell, this don't make sense. And, so, you know, I just decided that we just told, I had him on the phone again. I told him, I said, no, nah, we worked too hard. We need to know what's going on. And so uh, I went, got back in the pickup. And again, I thought, you know, Lord, I might be coming a little early, but I need to know what's going on here, you know? And so pick up all fired back up, no more problems. And we drove out there uh, to the ranch. And I don't know if you've ever been to the ranch, but we went up the hard way. Carl, you probably went the hard way if I was guessing. Um, but in saying that, uh, we went up the hard way and, and came off the top of the mountain and we went down to a platform and uh, that's when we didn't get to see the blue aura or the lightning strikes, but that's when we got to see uh, nine spacecraft sitting there. Uh, they all came in three, three and three and uh, they were like plates, just shiny, shiny plates, uh, uh, like a plate on top of a plate, you know, backwards. I don't know how you, a sphere, I guess. And so they would come in three, three and three, and they came in from the northeast, which when have you ever seen one cloud come in from the northeast and park? Well, these weren't clouds. They, uh, they, were, they were metallic. Uh, they came in three, and, and once they parked on the side of, a, of that mountain, they, they, were still, they were still not touching anything. So they wouldn't park, they were just there. And um, once they would, would so-called park in midair, they didn't make no noise, they, they didn't do anything. They were just there, and then they would start blowing this fog around their, uh, around their craft like a, uh, well, just like a fog. And so they started looking like a, uh, a cloud. And so there was three and then three more come up and three more come up. So Nikoloff always said that there was 12. I always said there was nine, but you got to understand when something like that happens, it's very overwhelming. So you're trying to concentrate on what one's doing instead of nine. Uh, but they were all the same. There was, there was nine of them all the way across the side of the mountain. 
Uh, I wasn't close enough to check the oil in their craft, but I was dang sure pretty close. And so uh, uh, I'm just saying that they let us watch watch those craft until we got enough of seeing what was going to go on there that night. And then when, when we left, they left. And uh, we were informed who they were the next day. And uh, that was with the group uh, Jeremiah was with. Who were they? What did they tell you? So, yeah, Jeremiah Davis, he was... Um, the story behind him, and, and I know this because I dealt with him for from basically 08 till he passed away in, in, in 18, I guess, is that he was drafted out of the CIA to Area 51. And in Area 51, he was drafted there from that area. Let's see how to say that. He was drafted by the United Galactic Federation of Hendon. And uh, there's, you know, it's all documented on that whole deal, but uh, he, was, he was a general for them, but he was not a general from here. And that's whose craft they were. Wait a minute. You know, what do you mean he was not a general from here? What do you mean from the US or from Earth? He was, he was, he was, he was just like us but they watched him for over 30 years and they drafted him into the Federation. And uh, I know this is hard to imagine and believe. And, and if I wouldn't have seen all these craft, I, I, it would be hard for me to believe, but uh, I seen 10 total craft and uh, uh, they showed me so much other stuff and, and ran tests for us on projects, but uh, it's real. And it's not it's not easy for an old Texas guy to talk about this. You know, it's it's uh, you know this is not what I thought I'd be turning sixty five and be telling them about. I'll guarantee you that much. So, uh, but it's real, and uh, I think it's very important that our kids and our grandkids know that there's more out there than what we're being told. Uh, maybe they don't know. Uh, maybe the government doesn't know and religions don't know, but I, I think some of them do. And, and I just want my grandkids to be able to move forward with the truth of what we know it instead of a kind of a cover up and they get a uh, job that just doesn't even make sense. Why not chase the dream of what we're getting to chase here also? And that's, that's why it's coming forward and, and, uh, it's kind of a bumpy ride and it's not a pity party. It's just that, uh, you know, it needs to be told. And that's what groups like all of us here are doing. And, and that's, that's a very honorable thing to even get to get to have a conversation with y'all and everybody else and, and uh, even be a part of a documentary that's helping to tell that story from like Discovery and Cargo 7 to give us a platform, give me a platform to get to tell that story is, it's just huge. It's, it's, you know, it's, uh, it's humbling. Yeah. So what did he tell you after that night? And, you know, yeah. What did you learn from him about it? Um, and was he at that time, so he was earlier working at, at, at um, Area 51, but was he still working with the CIA and the US government when he was having you guys drill this? Or do you think, or was he moved on? And what what was he able to share with you at that point after you, you'd already seen, you disobeyed the orders. He said, don't come, don't come. And you're like, we're coming anyway. We just spent all this time, 200 people trying to drill this stuff out for you guys. We wanna know how interesting that your car wouldn't work and that the radios were going off. Mm -hmm. um, but then what happened afterwards? Like, what was he able to share and who was he exactly? So, so there was only about four guys out there on that project. The, the hundred people, you know, that was in the refinery setting where we worked. But, uh, you know, they monitored that deal for years and they would give me updates all the time uh, about what's going on in that area. And uh, they would talk about craft that come in because the Federation would watch that area because of what took place. So it brought an intrigue to other craft. And so I was always getting reports from, uh, from 
Jeremiah and the Federation of uh, other things that have taken place out there. And, and again, it's, it's, it's so crazy to even be talking about this, but yet we, we've proven the things about what's going on in the energy zones and the ley lines and all this whole deal. And, and there's also, uh, you know, we got reports that there's an object down there about 100 foot, 150 foot down in the ground. And, and so uh, that sounds crazy, but then again, all the equipment goes crazy out there. And so uh, like, you know, Cargo 7, you know, they have drones out there uh, over the area that we were told, you know, where it lit up with the Blue Aura. And, uh, you know, I told Cargo 7, you know, at one time they said uh, these, these drones, I can't imagine them paying that much for them, but, you know, they said some of these drones are like $20,000. Now, you know, I don't know that. I'm just saying they're throwing a number out there. And I said, well, you need to pay attention and not launch from right here because, you know, you'll you'll have fits. <clears throat> so um, they said, look, you know, we, we kind of know what we're doing and you do what you do and we'll do what we do. So they launched that drone and the next thing you know, their screen goes blank and uh, that drone was drove right over there and ran in the side of the mountain, crashed it. And, and you know, and so they, they said, you know, that's not even supposed to happen. We got another drone. Well, guess what? They launched another one and it crashed that one too. And, and, and finally, I think they would believe me a little bit, but you know, there for a, a, a little bit of the time, they thought that maybe what I was telling them was, was, you know, just a, a story, but no, it's, it's a real project and it's, there's so much stuff going on out there. And <clears throat> I'm sorry, but I, I think I forgot your question. Well, <laughs> I'm, I'm so interested in this, in the electromagnetics of, of the area. It's near Skinwalker Ranch and it's, you know, James Keaton is also talking, you know, it's, it's in this, in this very particular position. And obviously if, lightning and blue earth is coming out at certain points and they knew where to dig for them. Something is there. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah. I also want to know, so who was this guy um, that was knowing about this? And was he, is he, was he working for the U.S. government or was he just like, he, he was digging there and then, or was it, uh, Tell me more about him and, and what he was able to share with you and what he told you and, and things like that. Because I think he, I think I remember you saying that he really secretly wanted you to tell the world about this. And that was part of what fueled you to speak out, right? So, uh, yes, uh, uh, you know, I, I put a name for it and I call it favor for favor. And so uh, later on, after I learned about, you know, everything that's going on and I got to see the crafts, I got to see one more after that. But, um, you know, they did a, a huge favor for somebody in my family. And so on his deathbed, you know, he basically uh, uh, wanted the favor to be returned and it was to tell the world that there's more out there than what the government and or religions are telling us and, and right or wrong is it's not anybody's fault but uh you know there just is more out there and we need to all know that and uh i didn't have a clue where all this was going to go i just knew that um he was he was telling me the truth uh I was I was there uh, basically within a week or so of his death, and and on his deathbed, you know, I, you know, I told him, I said, you know, sir, I've never lied to you, and I dealt with him for over ten years, and he says, nor I lied to you, and I said, I just want you to know, I got the story out there, and he grinned, a sick, sick man, he grinned, and he says that you did. And so it was to help fulfill the favor of what he did for my, for my family, uh, which is very hard to talk about. So, so I, I don't know why we, we just move forward and, and I, I, I hate it because, because on this man's deathbed, his family didn't believe 
what he did. And so in turn, you know, my goodness. And so knowing what I know and, 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 and the, and the, you know, the, the conversations I had with him for over 10 years, sometimes two a week, and they would last in, in, you know, into the hour of some time. And he would make sure that I was aware of different situations. They, you know, uh, he would tell me so many things like, you just need to know that uh, the highest technology, if we have a, th if our, if our technology is a thousand years in advance, when you need to know that we still cannot get away from an electric motor, even if we have free energy, we still have to turn it into horsepower, you know, and it was all these things, just one after the other of, of how things work, how their crafts work, how they, how they, uh, defy gravity, uh, outer shell has to be one gravitational pull. The inside has to be the other, or they'll, you know, they'll travel so fast. And when they stop, you get slapped up the, up like a bug, you know? So they, he always talked about so many things, you know, he, I, I, you know, for years, he, he, he talked about that. You just need to know that there's no such thing as deep, dark space. You know, it doesn't get dark headed into a flashlight. Um, and he talks about the only place it's dark is on the backside of any, any planet. Uh, you can get your mind around that one, you know, and, uh, but if you do the if you do the math and, and look at the sun as being 90 times bigger than the earth, you know, sideways, the, the diameter or the distance across, and you just draw it out with a simple pencil, you know, it just like wow, you know. He said it's it's daylight everywhere, you know. Um it just there's just so many things that we talked about. And he would always say, you need to know this. You need to know this, you know, and, you know, I just, it was crazy. But uh, it, it helps to tell the story now. Uh, it's not an easy story, but, you know, I don't know. Anyway. Yeah, I just want to say um, thank you for sharing your story. I know sometimes it can be uncomfortable and you're here with thousands of people that are watching live or not live. Um, and they're, they're here because they're also pathfinders. And it's really heartbreaking to me um, that his family couldn't hear this and couldn't you know, absorb this information. And even you who had the experience is still trying to make you know, sense of it, but you're mm -hmm. speaking it out and, and you, you were, you know, the so cool. I hope that you kept some notes and journals or something of what he told you, because now as you start to share more, you know, the Discovery Channel is going to know that this is the next, you know, the Discovery Channel series is about gold and other things, but it's leading people through to this, this other thing. They're getting to know you. And I'm excited that you're sharing this with the world. And I'm excited that you're also expanding the conversation in the UFO symposium that you're holding. So this is kind of, you know, the hard part is done because you've talked about your story, but now um, you get to feel the, you know, the community coming in and all the other information that's going to be coming out from the shadows. So uh, do you want to talk a little bit about the symposium that you're holding and how it came about and, and what's going to be going on? We also have Carl here too, to, to talk about it. I, um, I would rather Carl just step in there and help me out on that because these guys, these guys are doing all the, all the, all the hard work. Uh, it, uh, the information came to us and, and it's just huge and take over Carl. Let's go. <laughs> <laughs> you bet. Uh, well, yeah, it's a pleasure to be here. I, uh, I think I, what happened was I was up in Vernal actually doing some work up there and touring Blind Frog Ranch and everything. And while I was up there, I had a mutual friend kind of reach out to me and he said, I have been uh, given some footage, some military grade footage that I believe is of 
unidentified craft or objects or entities of some kind that uh, they don't know what they are. And he was a little bit confused about what to do with it. And just the, the, the amount of coincidences that lined up, I had just, you know, met Dwayne and a few other people around Dwayne and his team and decided, well, instead of just like uploading this footage to YouTube where nobody's going to recognize it, it's not going to get seen by anybody. It'll just get immediately debunked. We need to get it analyzed and have it all looked at and reviewed by professional people. And then as that all went underway, uh, the results that came back were um, pretty surprising. And the momentum built up behind this military grade UFO footage to the point that uh, an entire symposium got built around it in order to bring it to the world as part of the disclosure movement and process with everything else coming out uh, from the military and the Pentagon already confirming uh, similar types of, of pieces of footage. And I haven't seen all of the footage, but um, now there's an entire team, like everybody that you announced at the beginning, uh, coming together that have reviewed and analyzed the footage, people that have um, experts in FLIR analysis like Dave Fouch, you've got uh, Michael Boyd, Avi Loeb, uh, James Keenan, Jim Segala, everybody that, uh, you know, pilot Chris Leto, he was an F-16 fighter pilot. And so he's done a lot of analysis on the previously released uh, Tic Tac footage that happened off of the West Coast. And, and so all of this is, is coming to the forefront. Now there's this four new pieces of footage that haven't been released yet. And the truth is, is that a lot of the footage is like, you know, it's over 20 minutes. There's a lot of footage that we have and it's being analyzed and uh, brought forward and then presented to the world, along with a lot of other interesting research projects and things revolving around with a, a group of great people that are coming together at the symposium. So on May 27th through the 29th is when it's going to be happening at the end of this month. And all of the keynote speakers are going to, to be there presenting their findings and their research uh, for people that get the VIP passes. There's even a concert and a dinner. You get to meet and greet with everybody, including Dwayne and, and a lot of the cast from Blind Frog Ranch. And um, also a tour of Blind Frog Ranch if you're a VIP person and uh, a lot of other cool perks. And so we've decided to make a whole event to bring everybody together to release the the footage and other stuff as well so uh yeah it's a really exciting event with a lot of things going on it's going to be over three days and it's revolving around this amazing area up there in the uinta basin with a, a whole list of strange activity from everything Dwayne is talking about to the stuff going on in the research in the community and the people that are dealing with it in their day-to-day -day lives and it's just a credible opportunity for everybody to come together and watch this footage and then talk about it and try to uh, move the ball further down the field towards disclosure and facing the truth with all of this. Yeah, amazing. Uh, thanks for all your hard work in organizing this and it will be a really bonding experience. Um, the waters, um, so you can go to bit.ly, um, bit.ly blind frog to get information about the symposium. And one of the cool things about Blind Fog Ranch is that the waters that have surfaced in this area have incredible healing um, powers. So people go there to become healed. So again, we're gonna talk a little bit more about some of the, the land, the electromagnetics. Of course, there's like Native American history and etchings and things like that. We're gonna ask, also ask um, Duane about his other sighting and also um, just a little bit more about his path and. And, and things like that. We're gonna go into breakout rooms very soon in a few minutes. So if you're watching live and you want to come in, ask Dwayne some questions at the end, or you want to hang out with other people that are in the movement, in the contact movement, in the disclosure movement, we invite you to go to lightnet.org slash hangout. Um, this will also get you into the other hangouts. It's, um, it's free to do that. So you can just hop over there and get in the Zoom. So one more question we're gonna ask um, before we go into the Zoom is, and Dwayne, you know, if you don't wanna talk about this, please just let me know, but you were talking about there being a favor for a favor and um, 
healing of your family member. Is that something you wanted to talk about or could talk about tonight or? Well, it was, it was uh, the, the technology that they used uh, uh, was a highly advanced uh, technology for somebody in my family and, uh, and uh, they shouldn't, you know, it's a miracle that, 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 that uh, they're alive right now. Uh, the doctors still don't understand it. Uh, <clears throat> I would like to say that the, the Federation has taken, uh, I was told that they take, they have taken all this technical healing type scenarios that they know about. It's a thousand years in advance of us. And so far they've taken it to a lot of different countries and uh, so far, uh, or let's just say within the last four years, uh, basically they, they didn't want to be a part of it uh, for whatever reasons, you know. So uh, there is highly advanced uh, medical things out there and, 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 and we all know that, uh, but for some reason our, our, our governments, uh, decide not to uh, put that out there to the world for some reason and uh, but I know I know it works and and, uh, and uh, seeing the crafts and things like that this is no game uh, uh, this is real and uh, if they can defy gravity and, and have uh, have uh, technology a thousand years more advanced than us, uh, why would I discount what uh, happened to somebody in my family, but yet we don't we don't use it now within our 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 reaches of uh, I hate to get politics on that deal, but there's there's more out there than what we're being told. Yeah, you know, and I think a lot of this stuff that's going to surface. Um, just with time and if it's not happening here in the US, it'll happen somewhere else. You know, we're, we're a big planet with a lot of countries and a lot of people talking and a lot of people experimenting. I have experienced some very high tech devices, health devices in the last year. And they're just mind blowing, like absolutely mind blowing. And so I think it's just important again you know, LightNet's whole mission is to create a living library of this stuff. So it's a little bit more organized and then really just finding out um, how people are healing themselves. So we can do it with technology, but we can also do it with Reiki. Like, how is that even possible? It's possible for someone to put their hands on you and to heal you. I mean, so we're really, this is where the curiosity comes in and this is where our collective wisdom comes in and we need to understand these things a little bit better because um, it's so, it's like gives us hope. It's so hopeful and it's so fascinating and so important. So right now I just wanna give a shout out to my co-founder, Daniel Rekchan, who's here tonight. Um, I also want to give a shout out to our members here, John West, um, Ralph Steiner, who's doing a great documentary on the ET embassy, Gregor, uh, Noel, Pauline, Solange, a ton of you guys, thanks for being here tonight. And I'm going to start the Zoom rooms. Um, they're going to last for 20 minutes. Set a timekeeper in your group. If you'd like to join them, you can. And you can share um, a contact experience you've had or healing experience you've had, um, or you can just hold space and they can talk about the support they need in their life. Uh, so each person will have five minutes. Um, don't start talking right away because I'll be moving around the contact groups. And once again, uh, Dwayne, you're going to stay here with me in the main group. Uh, so, um, so we'll stay here and continue the interview and others can watch it later. So here we go. So Dwayne, I wanted to ask you, um, what happened, you know, one of the things we're doing um, in LightNet is, is working with radios. So what actually happened with your radio that night? And has it ever happened later? Absolutely not. Uh, it was like a, the, the radio was, was, was basically even off. Uh, you know, we had speakers on for, for talking on the, on the phone. Uh, and uh it was like a uh, 
a, a, a grown noise of of a, of a language uh, that uh, you could kind of make out a little bit of it, but yet it was just a, it was a, it was a, oh, I don't know how to say it. It was just a groaning, dungy uh, type of uh, feeling as it was coming out of the radio. And, and then that's when things started uh, in the vehicle. Still don't know where the ticking came from, but it sounded like it was a, it was a ticking bomb. And, and uh, so Jeremiah Davis, which was on the phone with us, told us to get out of the vehicle. He says, you just don't know who you're dealing with. This is a dangerous situation. And, and uh, basically, you know, on the phone, after I got out and walked down the road, you know, looked like a bunch of idiots out there standing right in front of a vehicle, like what the heck is going on? But, you know, uh, uh, he, he told us, he said, what you got to do is you got to get back to town. You got to get to where there's lights. Uh, you'll be safer there. And, and I said, no, no, we're going to go out and we're going to see what, uh, what's going on. That's, you know, uh, why work hard if you don't get to see the results, you know? Yeah. Like you said, you were a high risk uh, contractor. So that's already in your blood to be so curious and to not be scared of danger. So do you think that they were trying to stop your car and then you convinced them that you were going and they said, okay, we'll just let him go. Well, I don't, I don't think it was, you know, and, and that's a, that's a, that's a way of thinking about it. I never thought about it that way because I, uh, from everything I could see, they were for us. So it had to be of another group that was, was uh, not for us. And, and so in turn, whatever, whatever happened out there, it, it pretty well, if I understand it right, it pretty well brought the attention of governments and also upstairs people of other 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 races, I guess you might say. Uh, what did what did you get a feeling about the different races? And what did you get a feeling about why they showed up that night? And did you ever get a feeling about that, about what was going on? No, the only thing that that I got to see was the craft at that night. Now we've seen uh, we've seen uh, video lightning strikes and, and plasma arcs on the ground and things like that since uh, to prove the point of what Jeremiah was talking about about the blue war and the lightning strikes. So we have all that proof. Uh, the only thing I would know about different uh, entities is what I was told by him. I've never experienced or seen anything like that. Uh, I was told, you know, I was told what their uniforms look like. Uh, uh, I was told, you know, where the markings are. And, and I did see one of those guys. Um, <laughs> uh, it's crazy, but I guess there was some more bad stuff going on. And so I got to see one of those guys. Um, uh, and, uh, and I know this sounds so crazy, but at a, at a shopping mall, uh, they were keeping they were keeping eyes on me. Uh, so uh, you know, uh, their groups just big old stout, good looking people, you know, and uh, uh, they wore a tight blue uniform with a jacket over it, and they had a star right there at the bottom of their waist. And, and uh, he, had, he had always told me what they wore, their group. And so in turn, there was a whole bunch of people around. And I seen a guy that was kind of staring at, at a distance at me. And so in turn, for me to know, to know that he was with the Federation, whenever I finally looked at him, he opened his jacket and there was that star on his, on his belt line and so he acknowledged and uh and i acknowledged him and and uh but to this day you know they would never tell me just how big of a how, how much trouble i'm when he, i was in you know they just for some reason were there to take care of some business i guess yeah wow how fascinating so um 
we have Alan who's going to come on in a second uh, to talk about his uh, UFO making contact series, which is going to be an incredible addition to his book. Um, Alan, are you ready right now or do you need a minute here? We've got him here. Let's see. Alan, um, I'm going to give you a minute. Um, and why don't we, why don't you talk? So you said, Dwayne, that you saw a second UFO. Was that, was that the most other, most like riveting emotional experience you had was seeing the second, the second time that you saw one or was they, it? They, they were all overwhelming uh, to a point, but it, it just made sense, you know? And so the, the next one I saw, um, for whatever reason, it's like you got to give them permission. Uh, uh, so in turn, you know, I kind of in a, in, a, in a redneck way gave them permission that I wanted to see something else. And I think a lot of this is so I don't drop the ball on how I can even talk about it to this day, you know, uh, without being able to see the things that, that I've been showed. I, I would be under the table here if I had to talk about this stuff, but it, it's just, uh, it happened uh, uh, one morning about five o'clock in the morning. Uh, oh, you know, here we go. So uh, about five o'clock in the morning, I was, I woke up with an overwhelming uh, thought that I need to go outside. I need to go get some binoculars and go outside and look up. And so this is crazy. Who, who wakes up with a thought like that? You know, this is, this is pure silly, but I did, but I didn't, I didn't follow the orders that I was supposed to, because I just got up and walked outside in the, in the back and I, and I lived on a couple acres out in the country. And then it was pretty wide open up there. So uh, whenever I walked out and looked up, uh, there was a craft right above uh, my house and uh, it was it was huge uh, to say how big it was I don't guess I'll ever know because how how high was it up or how low was it up would give you a difference in your in, in how big something is but they just let me look at it uh, they would turn the lights on and let them just circle around the craft you know and kind of like a you know they were they were showing off you might say I guess and and there was a big uh, glow or bulb on the bottom, just a huge, I would think it'd have to be something like how they could observe something that's underneath them, you know? So it's just, it was, that thing was huge. And so they would turn the lights on, they would spin them around and, and they'd make different lights go different directions. And, and so I was, I was very excited about that whole deal, you know, and I wasn't worried about it, but it didn't make any noise. Um, this thing is huge, but yet it's defying gravity. Uh, and so they just let me look at it as long as I wanted. And so I was, I was married at the time and I was excited about that. So I thought, well, you know, somebody else has to see this. And, and so, uh, not everybody wants to get up at five o'clock in the morning and, and go out and look up and, 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 and look at the spacecraft, you know, uh, because it was just overwhelming. And so finally I got my wife up at that time and we walked out there and they, they backed it up, shut all the lights off where all you could see was just a globe on the bottom. So, you know, I thought, come on, you know, you know, I need somebody to witness this besides me. Uh, but that wasn't the point. Uh, their point was that um, their point was that their group always thought I was telepathic and they wanted to prove it uh, to their higher ups that, that I was. And that was the reason they did that. And they would never let me talk about it. I would bring it up to Jeremiah. I said, come on, I, I just don't know if that happened. And he would shut me off. He said, it did, Dwayne. It did. Don't talk about it. And so, you know, that's, you know, there's certain things they, they didn't want me to talk about. Uh, and they got to have permission. He always told me they have to have permission to even let somebody see those things unless it's accidental. 
So I don't know. I, you tell me. It's it's crazy. Yeah, well, so that's really great that you have, um, you know, opened yourself up to telepathy because that's one of the ways that we know from our surveys and collective intelligence that that's, that that's the way they communicate. And that's, and that's really critical. Um, I wanted to ask you, one, one of the stories I heard you speak um, at a conference and I was just like so blown away by your story about your SAT tests. Uh, in high school. And I don't know if you would say that's telepathy, maybe you would, but why don't you tell them about that? Because it talks about what all of our inborn capabilities are when it comes to knowing. Um, it's just that not everybody listens. So. Um, uh, again, another crazy story. So that's what I had to live with after, after I understood that. Uh, it, it came, uh, look, I was, a, I was a C student and I always thought C meant correct, but it doesn't. It, 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 you know, I was the low guy on the totem pole. And uh, so in turn, uh, the teachers, they would always, they would always ride me and, and, and say I wasn't paying attention and, you know, the whole deal. And, and it's just part of it. But uh, it came to the point where the SAT test, uh, uh, everybody has to take it, you know, and so I was going to go take it, but I knew that by the teachers and what they told me that I'd never go to college, I'd never do any of this. And so in turn, uh, when it came down to the colleges, I just put the highest level colleges there were out there because I was just, oh, what the heck, you know, we'll just say I want to go to the this this college, this college. And, and uh, so when I went to take the ACT test, I guess you might say that it's the first time that I could put my mind in a neutral because I knew that it, it didn't matter. I was going to graduate. I was going to go do something else. And so in turn, once you, you, once you find out you can put your mind at a neutral, that's when things start coming to you. So on the ACT test, I never read a question. I never read the answer, but I was told the answer and I would just mark them until I got to a certain point and then I was told that's enough. And, and nothing made sense about this whole deal. And about two weeks later, the ACT test, yeah, I think the ACT test came in and the scores came back. And the next thing you know, I was called to the office and all my teachers were in the office and they were mad. They were so mad, it's unreal. And they had me sit in a chair and each and every one of them started chewing me out, saying you have physically made us look like a fool because of what you pulled off on the ACT test versus what your grades used to be. And so uh, I had one teacher, she was, she was crying. She was so upset. And I didn't understand that. But what happened was that because I put all these high-level colleges down, that I was accepted before the, our smart guys. And so that's why they were so upset was that they said, you, you, moved, you moved them down a notch. And I, I thought, oh, well, you know, but I'm just saying that's, that's what took place and it's all on record. And, and uh, but that's where I found out by being able to go to a neutral, uh, that's when everything's really just come to you. And, and uh, I don't know how to explain that, but then the Federation verified it uh, later on, so. Wow, that's what do you mean the Federation verified it later on? So that's so fascinating because sometimes these first experiences that you have inform the other ones, just like you intending and asking, you know, like, hey, I want to see the, the craft. Um, and then you putting your your mind in neutral and this coming through. What do you mean about the permission? And then how did it evolve? How did you develop it from there? 
So that was an eye-opening deal. And, and th throughout my life, you've always had these people show up and say, you just need to know this and you need to know this and where they just come from. Why do they show up and just what comes through their mouth that wouldn't have normally came through their mouth, you know? And so I don't know where to go with any of this, but the Federation was the one that said, we always thought you were telepathic. And so in turn, that's why they put the ship behind my house and bombarded me with thoughts and the, uh, which wasn't a, wasn't a scary deal. I mean, yeah, I looked at it just like it was a new Chevy. I mean, I thought, well, this is, this is nice, you know? Uh, and then all the, all the things that we talked about ever after, or always after that just made sense. You know, uh, uh, they, they just talked about so much, so much stuff that you just need to know this, Dwayne, you need to know this. And, and and there would be a time or two they just keep, or he would kind of repeat himself. And I say, "Look, I get it. I get it. You don't have to tell me twice, you know, type of stuff." But it's I don't know. Um, <clears throat> so many interesting things about how how their craft travels and and uh, how they uh, it's like they can send out a void in front of their craft. Uh, and then they chase an empty space. And so to slow their craft down, they can pull that space back. And, uh, but they have to have an outer gravity protection and an inner gravity protection. And they talk about all that stuff. They talk about their weaponry and, and how it's a thousand, 10,000 years in advance of what anything we have. I will say this, and, I, and I'll probably get in trouble over this one, but, uh, from what I've seen in the technology and the crafts that I've seen in the whole nine yards, I and I hope I hope this is right. Uh, I'd be surprised if there's one nuclear weapon that could go off. That's just way above and beyond uh, all that all that stuff. You know, they got too many components, and uh, you can look up on the Dome of the Rock in uh, in uh, on YouTube and. And that was one of uh, Jeremiah Davis's craft that, uh, that that came down on top of the Dome of the Rock and fired a, a beam down and then shot up. That was the Federation that did that. And I know all that. Wow, that's fascinating. Yeah, I mean, when people talk about the aliens being dangerous and stuff, I'm always like, oh my gosh. You know, they, yeah, they can stop us from you know, blowing ourselves up and they are more advanced, but it's not just that they're more advanced technologically, they're more advanced, they're, they're mature. You know what I mean? It's like there's kids that are playing and hurting each other. And then the parents are saying, Oh, let's all get along. Well, that's kind of like what's happening. Um, they've been there, done that. And so at least that's my opinion. Um, what, what are the things that they told you that you felt were the most important things you know, they kept saying, you need to know this, you need to know this, you need to know this. What were the things that you want to tell us that really stuck with you and feel that's important for the world to know right now? Oh, my. You know, when you, when you, when you talk to somebody for over 10 years, uh, uh, there's, there's just so much stuff. Uh, you just, I think one of the most important things that he would overemphasize the fact is that uh, all the governments aren't bad. Uh, there's good and bad in, in every culture. There's good and bad in every, every agency. Uh, and sometimes who seems to be bad or doing what they're told that think they're doing it for the honor and glory of the, of the flag. And, and so it's all compartmentalized so much. Um, you know, I've, I've seen Jeremiah just on the phone. I, I heard him on the phone, just, just downright, just want to cry because, you know, what he had found out that they did back a long time ago, thought that they were doing it for the right cause, come to find out later on that he found out that it was the wrong cause and, and it, it just break his heart. But, you know, there's so many people out there that are doing it for the right reason, but maybe 
the higher ups are not telling them everything that, that they need to know. Uh, so, uh, you know, I, I, you know, how do you, how do you say what's, what's more important whenever you, 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 you spent, you know, 10 years talking to a person about the ups and downs in their life. Um, I would, I would have to say that, the, the the big heartbreak would be um and i think we all are are heading down that path unless we can change it is that uh you know on your deathbed um you know for those type of people that have helped save the world but yet on their deathbed it's lonely uh, because you know they 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 sign paperwork or something that they can't talk about. Uh, I don't know. I mean, um, you know, I, I just don't know uh, what's more important. Is it, is it more important that we know that uh, with the advancement of, 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 of a thousand years in advance that they can't get away from an electric motor? Or is it about that, my gosh, let, let the people that know help us uh, understand more that we can tell our, our grandchildren, look, don't go down that path, go down another path and you will help society even, even, even greater. So I don't know. Uh, I danced around that question again. Sorry. No, that was great. And it, and it gets down to this, this question that it's like, um, we're, we're not, I am not going to rest until we all have the full information. Because like you're saying, when things get really compartmentalized and you're making decisions based on 80% of the information, that's, we cannot do that. We cannot do that going forward. We can't have doctors that are saying, um, I can't do anything to save your life when they have part of the information. And we can't do that with disclosure either. We have to come together. We have to bank this knowledge um, and we need to do it in an open source way, in an open data commons way. And, you know, when I talk to James uh, Keenan, who's gonna be at your UFO symposium, you know, he was learning stuff that the three letter agencies had entire year long symposiums about. And he's out there in the field with stuff he can buy on Amazon or whatever. So that's the empowerment that's happening right now in our community is that we can do this research ourselves. We can talk about it. We can share information. We can create these bonds and connections with um, these federations and with our, each other and ourselves. And so I really think the work that you and Carl and everybody at Blind Frog Ranch is doing is amazing. And I also, um, I have um, Alan Steinfeld here, who's gonna talk about a little bit about his making contact uh, program that he's putting on that's gonna be um, an extension of his, of his book. And again, it's like, let's bring together the brightest minds. Let's start these conversations. And let's let's begin to um, sorry, Alan. I'm looking for you on the screen. There we go. Um, and, and and then let's actually have contact experiences. You know, the LightNet software is not done yet. And Alan's like, well, let's just do it anyway. And I was like, you're right. Let's just do it anyway. So we're going to be starting these small groups and bringing people through contact experiences, whether it's through meditations or dreams or CE fives. And I'm just so grateful for Alan for what. He's, he just led a remote viewing course. You know, this is a hands-on course. This is what it's gonna take because you can't necessarily believe someone's story or read it, you know what I mean? Or, or watch a movie. You, we've got to start having these experiences and we've got to start talking about them. So if you go to bit.ly um, slash making contact 2022, um, you can find out more um, about Alan's program the new realities of disclosure and comic, uh, cosmic awakening. And I'll let him talk about it, um, but it's starting next Thursday. So it's really starting now. Welcome, Alan. Thanks so much for everything you do. Hey. Thanks, Zinka. Thanks for doing this program. Even though I was busy, I would have loved to hear what Dwayne has to say, because this is a time we come together as a planetary civilization. I think we can't depend on government. We have to take 
um, reality back into our own hands because it's been co-opted by people trying to manipulate what we should think and what we should say. And, and so I've developed this series, but it has to do with everything you guys have been talking about. So I'll show you a poster for this coming upcoming series, which is um, a deep dive into disclosure. And this is like starts May 19th, but we go June 2nd, where actually I have Danny Sheehan coming on and Steve Bassett talking about what's going to be happening, what would have happened on Tuesday, on June 2nd, you know, the, the, the House hearings, the first in 50 years, did you talk about that? That's going to be happening on May 17th. And we're going to have a watch party, me and Zinka, on this channel about the House hearings on May 17th. But anyway, this is a whole series I'm putting together. Linda Moulton Howe, I think, is one of the best um, researchers in the field. Whitley Strieber, who's probably been abducted more times than anyone. Nick Pope. Um, so this is a deep dive conversation into the inner workings of, of this phenomenon and trying to come up with maybe not answers, but put some of the pieces together. Everything Dwayne is doing, everything everyone here is interested in. We need to lay it all out on the table for the American public and the world to see and start to make connections and see where we are and to understand that reality, which is Blind Frog's Ranch thing, is not what we thought it was. It's not. There's so much more to existence and we have to start exploring who we are as human beings and then we can really make a difference. So if you want some more information about that, go to Making Contact Series. Um, dot com and then join us on this conversation because the only way things are going to change is if we make a change ourselves if we come up and say yes this happened to me this was my experience this is what I think yeah I saw that and come out of the closet and just say this is the true nature of existence everything else was just been surface level and so we have a chance now to change the reality into what it really is, and maybe that will create abundance, peace, happiness, and prosperity. What do you think, Dwayne? I, I agree 100%. We all just have to, you know, just just come forth with our truth. And even if it's bumpy, uh, that's the only way we get to where we need to go. Right. So, yeah, I mean, what you've discovered there on the ranch is something that most people will deny its existence. How, how do you think we should get this message out to the world that there's more to reality than we've been told? You know, I, you know, I, I, I don't know. All I know is that uh, uh, I dealt with uh, Jeremiah Davis and they opened up a whole new world for me, not just in Utah, but in different areas of the country, uh, that uh, is just uh, mind-boggling. And uh, what a what a blessing to be a part of this time. I talked to Chad, and my son, uh, yesterday, and and I said, you know, you just can't beat this time in our life because uh, because there's stuff there's stuff coming down the pike, and it's uh, they can't deny it, and uh, I don't know. It's a, uh, it's a blessing. So, uh, is Avi Loeb going to be at the ranch and some of those other people? Are they showing up or on zoom? Carl, do you know on that? that deal? Yeah, I think almost all of the keynote speakers are going to be there and present at the symposium and attending. I think Avi Loeb is going to be broadcasting simply because he's overseas. And so it's a little bit expensive for him to make the trip himself, but everybody else is going to be there and uh, collaborating together and looking at the footage and, and uh, talking about each other's research projects and how we can all work together on what we're discovering and all these different uh, aspects and approaches to the phenomenon. So what do you think the next step would be, Carl, after we all come together there at the ranch and after we hear the hearings that may be gone going, where do we go as a, a community? What do you suggest? Well, I think uh, it's a really good opportunity for everybody to network and become familiar with each other in a new way and approach this from a higher level and a new perspective. So I think it's uh, 
respecting each other's uh, work at that, uh, at the, from different approaches, because we have some people who are, you know, looking at the perspective of the geology and the phenomenon of how it affects us from an earth perspective and other people that are looking at astronomy and into deep space and from other people that are looking into the human consciousness and, and the soul's connection with the phenomenon. And so everybody's coming together. And so I think it's a, a matter of finding what resonates with you when you participate in the symposium and what relates to your own personal experiences and then networking and, and joining and participating with the research projects and professionals in those similar fields that uh, are attractive to you, that you feel like are something that you can contribute in and then join in that work. Like Chris Leto, he's launching uh, sensors into space along with, uh, with uh, other scientists that are participating in the event, launching sensors into space and, and putting them up in the ranch and other places around the basin. And so there's ways to participate, to uh, crowdsource and fund different projects. And so the symposium is a good opportunity to sample what everybody's doing and then jump in and participate and join in because we live in a world where you can do that and get involved now. That's great. No, maybe you can make uh, someone can make a guest appearance on the series that I'm doing with uh, Linda and Whitley and just kind of whatever comes out of the symposium, you could announce it in the series and um, get a bigger network of people coming together. So thank you. I mean, Absolutely. I'd be happy to do that and uh, come back for the results of the reviews and the symposium and kind of all of that. And we can chew on it and, and see what, what comes of it and collaborate uh, across all the different aspects and teams working on this. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe on the June 2nd show, because that show will have uh, Danny Sheehan and Steve Bassett on talking about the latest disclosure news. So it might be good to come on that time. So I'll get your information from Zanka and yeah. um, we'll just go from there. Let's so, do it. I'd love to. All right. Thanks. Um, Zinka. any, uh, anything yeah. else? Yeah, so we just have 15 more minutes and I wanted to open it up to questions. Uh, if you have a question, but you're not in the Zoom room, um, you can come in the Zoom room by, by looking at this lightnet.org slash hangout. Um, but I wanted to see if there's any questions here from the people that are in the Zoom room. You can raise your hand by using the um, reactions tab at the bottom and raising your hand. You can also just type it into the chat. Um, but this has been so great, Dwayne, to hear that you've cultivated this relationship with someone so special over the years and that, that he basically entrusted you to tell what he could not tell. Um, and this is kind of the, the baton pass that's happening right now is that it's up to us as people to come and share this information. And like, as Carl is saying, let's all get excited about this and start doing the research. Like, oh, someone's doing some satellite thing. Okay, well, if you don't have time, give them money. If you don't have money, give them time. Like, let's get in here and let's do this stuff. Um, you know, Alan just did a remote viewing um, workshop at uh, Dream Magic with Adrian of Awaken World and Rachel of Dream Magic. And it's so cool. So in my house, I set up three different targets that they remote viewed. And then they also are going to remote view what I'm going to place in, in there tomorrow. I don't even know what I'm going to place in my bookshelf tomorrow. But so how interesting. We just did that, Zinka. We <laughs> just did that experiment with everyone yes. in the room here. We've all, we all have our answers. We all, <laughs> we all know what you're going to place on the shelf tomorrow. So <laughs> This spoon bending, these are the superpowers that have been hidden from us because we yeah. are non-local consciousness. So, yes. That's so exciting, you guys. That's so exciting. Well, there's no one's consciousness that's stronger than Rachel's. She's amazing. Uh, and she co-hosts our spoon bending parties, which we're doing. Um, and we're getting all these crazy results, right? We're bending the buckles. We've got people bending without touching them. We're, we've just, we're spreading seeds in our hands. This right. is what this is all, this is citizen science. This is our consciousness. This is us connecting with 
This is connecting with ourselves and each other and sharing the information, not you know, behind a Masonic temple, you know, like out in the open. So we invite everyone to join LightNet. Um, our, we're going to be raising our membership um, in very soon, maybe even next week. So it's $44 for the whole year and you get a spoon bedding every month. And Rachel um, hosts them in uh, Sedona and you can come for $25 uh, and kids come free. So it's really exciting times. Uh, Rachel, yeah, do you want to share anything? <laughs> Let's see here. I can get this on the screen. Yeah. Fork, spoons. Um, yeah, so this is this is the studio, Dream Magic, right over here. If you want to show them a little. Mm -hmm. This is it. It's my art studio, but also a place to have events like tonight. We had remote viewing. Zinka and I teach spoon bending once a month. Uh, I do magic wand making, painting classes. I think art and creativity is one of the best ways to tap into our unconscious. And this is how we change the world, by the creative imagination, by doing these things that people thought they couldn't do. And, oh, Rachel I, has her book. Yeah, and I didn't think that I was a painter until I made an art studio in Sedona, started painting, and then I ended up painting spirit animals because they called to me. And after three years of painting, I was able to make a book, Spirit Animal Wisdom. It's got 300 pages of animal message communication mm -hmm. plus oracle decks. So when, wow. I, when I really got out of the way and listened to my calling, I was able to do things I didn't think I could do. Right. Actually, speaking of books, I've just <laughs> written Making Contact. I want to give a gift to everyone here. If you send me your email, I won't send you the whole book, but I'll send you the introduction to Making Contact. Go to, I'll put it in the chat, but it's newrealities at earthlink.net, and I'll send you the intro, which is an overview of the UFO phenomena and and I have experts, I mean, this is not my book, it's contributions by Linda Moulton Howe and Grant Cameron and Whitley Strieber. So I've looked at some of the best people I felt in the field and put them all together in this collection. So I'll just put, if you want a little piece, a little segment, I think Karen already has it, but I, you know, a little segment, um, just email me and I'm happy to send that out in support of all of Zinka's work and... Um, you know, this is a collective movement. We are in this together. You know, my, my favorite quote by Martin Luther King is, we may have all come on a different ship, but now we're all in the same boat. So it's like, here we are. Here we are in the same boat, trying to figure out the future because nobody knows where this thing is heading, but it's up to us to carve the path in the density of time and space to create the world we want to be in. So let's start making contact with ourselves, with the earth, with each other, and whatever's out there, because I think, you know, there may be some negative forces, but I think if we have a positive attitude, the world responds positively to us, you know? Bashar says, you know, if you're looking in the mirror and the guy in the mirror is not smiling, you don't go up to the mirror and try to make the guy smile. It comes inward, and then, you know, you change the world. So that's, that's my little piece. So thank you, Zinka, for hosting this with some of my friends. Thank you so much, Alan. Yeah, you know, this is, you know, what Rachel shared is a really empowering message. And what Carl does is also very empowering. So he's going out there. He's interviewing all these people. He's looking at the ruins. He's looking at the drawings on the wall. And he's following his curiosity. And that's exactly what Dwayne did. And that's exactly what led him into this incredible life that he's, that he's doing. And, you know, you're really knocking it out of the ballpark, Dwayne and Alan, for this movement. So we really appreciate it. We have a question here. Mark, um, you're unmuted. So go ahead and ask your question for Dwayne or whoever it's for. Yeah. Um, thank you, Dwayne, for being here. and, and uh, with your project that you're going to be putting on. And I was wondering, um, do you have any, is there going to be any technology revelations? Is there, I know you're going to have the video or the, the footage of the UAPs and, and all that new stuff. Uh, but as far as any new technology, do we, is there anyone that's going to be presenting like an anti-gravity technique or a methodology or a machine? Uh, is there anything new in that field 
or that you know of that you could share with us? Is that my question? Yeah, so he's asking you, maybe you know some things that you were told about how the ships work in terms of anti-gravity. And then he's also asking, and maybe Carl can answer if there's people specifically at the um, UFO Disclosure Symposium that will be talking about the technology of a spacecraft. So uh, just a little bit that I know about as far as how the crafts work and things like that. Uh, 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 the, the neatest thing that, that I was told on that whole scenario is they, they send out a void or a vacuum and then they chase that vacuum, uh, you know, plus or minus five miles out is what Jeremiah always told me. And uh, for them to stop their craft, they pull that void slash vacuum back. Uh, and then it has any gravity on the outside shell and the inside shell to make sure that their people uh, don't get harmed. Uh, they always put a little bit of G-force on the inside because if not, it seems like a video game and they like to feel a little bit of it like they're flying instead of uh, just like they're sitting in a chair. And it can be that, that um, well, it, 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 they, uh, Jeremiah always told me they, they want to put a little bit of a, of a pull on them so it doesn't seem like a video game while they're going through space and, and taking off and, and stopping within the tenth of a second, uh, and um, so uh, that's all I I would know on that. Uh, they showed me the inside of ships as far as their their uh, uh, you know their uh, you know their boards and everything like that. But again, that's hard to prove. But yet, if I wouldn't have seen the ships and and on his deathbed, he said, "I never I never lied to you, Dwayne." So. In turn, uh, I, you know, we have uh, pictures of of, uh, of other planets uh, and their their uh, what their buildings look like and well, uh, what the trees look like and and lots of stuff. So uh, I don't know, Carl, help me out on this one. On <laughs> <laughs> I, I also wanted to ask you your theory on how why and how they punch into our reality. So why do they do it? When do they do it? Do they need the electromagnetic fields in your ranch or is it just like they wanted to show up? How, how and why do they punch in to the, to the reality? So, so basically we would get reports or I'd get reports on that, you know, different craft would come in and some had the capability of just going down into the area and either sending out a vibration or a frequency or something. And then they could make that aura, that blue aura come up out of the ground. And then they would drop down into it. Like it was maybe a filling station of some kind. Interesting. So do you think that they're pull, they, they need energy for the craft that, that they're pulling from the ground? I, I think that uh, there's so many different types of craft. Uh, if I understood Jeremiah and, and their craft, they pretty well had uh, a development of free energy anyway. Uh, so in turn, uh, Nikoloff and Jeremiah Davis would always argue about that uh, the outer skins of, of all their craft were like little bitty pyramids, uh, you know, just to... Uh, gather and, and store energy. So uh, Jeremiah would never admit to that, but he never denied it. Carl, we just have a two more minutes here. Did you have anything you wanted to share on this in terms of anything? Yeah, I think uh, what will be really fascinating for people as far as the symposium is concerned and the technology advancements, I would pay attention to the work scientific efforts of Jim Segala and Michelle Miners and what they're going to be presenting and what they have there. They have uh, developed actual scientific uh, sensors and devices that they've been placing with members of the community around the Uinta Basin and even around in California and different places. 
where there is a high rate of the phenomenon occurring, whether it be sightings in the sky or even activity in people's homes, out of body experiences that they recount at night or any anything in between. If they're reporting incidences and they sign up for this type of program, then Jim and Michelle can place these sensors in their home and even wearable devices so that when they report a different type of activity occurring or an abduction experience or anything, they can wake up the next morning or they can uh, go in from their backyard, report it on the website, and Jim and Michelle can actually go look at the sensor data and compare that. And what's amazing is they're starting to collect some pretty incredible results from that data showing flight paths overhead where the phenomenon might occur to someone uh, sleeping at night here and another person sees it in their backyard and then over there they have a strange occurrence and they can track a path and the data actually shows spikes and anomalies and things like the earth's electromagnetic field or the gamma rays things that are significant differences either up in the sky or in the earth uh, and even on the person's biology uh, and they are tracking all of that, sensing all of that. And you can even go into the outpost at, in Vernal, Utah, at the uh, Blind Frog Ranch outpost. And there's even a live display where you can watch some of the sensors running where the volunteers have offered up that information. So I would really pay attention to that because it's a way to uh, take the encounters and the experiences and the sightings and match it up with chronological data and scientific results based on the sensors that are being built and put out. And so that would be something that I would pay attention to uh, mm -hmm. as far as understanding the phenomenon, how it works and how it relates to our reality and us as humans. Hey, so I Carl, think that's going to be really fascinating. Carl, have you seen a, uh, Carolyn Corey's new movie, A Tear in the Sky, where they have some tracking device? Have you seen that? Yeah, it's very similar. In fact, I think a lot of their equipment might actually be a little bit uh, derivative of a lot of Jim Segala's uh, engineering and development with his sensors. It's really interesting. So if you want that like cutting edge development of where that's going and, and how you can take part in that, that's going to be a big part of the symposium that Jim and Michelle are going to be presenting as far as the technology. Great. Thanks. I'll, yeah. I'll be in touch, Carl. Thank you so much. You Thank bet. you. For me. Uh, so for the final little question here before we close, because I know it's late for Dwayne and Carl. And thank you for being with us. Um, so uh, that was the, is there any information about Jeremiah Davis and the Galactic Federation of Permanent? And also um, we've got a, a member that wants to know how to get these specific devices to, to support the, the research, so. <laughs> so the first question is, is there anything on the internet, Dwayne, about um, Mr. Davis? Jeremiah yes, Davis. yes, there is. In one of his speeches with Don Nikoloff a long time ago, uh, they speak about if you look up on YouTube, uh, General Jeremiah Davis and the United Galactic Federation attended, you'll see one of two of his speeches with Don Nikoloff. You'll listen to it. You'll also see a document on there where his mission statement uh, on his deathbed and, and who was there and who signed off on it. And I was one that signed. Uh, and uh, so it, it's, it's uh, heartbreaking on some of that stuff, but uh, you know, for, for us to get uh, on the same page with them, we got to stop being a, a warring uh, world uh, and uh and they're supposed to be watching to see if, if we get to get involved with, with how they operate. And there are over 574 uh, different planets that go under their wing. And uh, that does not mean that there's not thousands or tens of thousands of other galactic federations. That's just one of them. Uh, they always talk about the, 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 the volume of, they'd always say, Dwayne, you need to know that there's, there's billions of planets and trillions of stars in our galaxy. And there's billions, if not trillions of other galaxies. They did say, or he did say that once we get out of our galaxy, it gets a little more Western 
and they don't like to get out of this out of our galaxy because it's it's a little bit wilder out there on, on, on other realms. Is there like a field that surrounds our galaxy that makes it kind of cohesive for all the beings in the galaxy? Sir, I, I don't know. I, I just know what he, he kind of talked about. He uh, he did talk about there there are evil evil groups too, and it's a battle. Always good versus evil. Uh, you know, uh, so he talked about groups that, that they overtook and uh, the people that were of those groups are good people. They just thought they were doing it for the right reason, which in turn in our eyes was the wrong reason is what he would say. So I don't know. Thank, thank you for your time. Yeah, thanks everyone for joining us tonight. Carl has posted in the chat um, that if you want to learn more about these devices, um, you can go to mupas.org. That's M-U-P-A-S.org. Um, and again, the Making Contact series, you can get to bit.ly slash Making Contact 2022. This is the new realities thing. Thank you to Carl, Portal to Ascension, Alan, um, and the UFO Disclosure Symposium, symposium you can get to bit.ly slash blind frog, right? Um, all these people are gonna come and this is happening soon. This is happening in two weekends. Um, Alan's is happening next week. So we also invite you uh, to the Spoon Manning, which will be the first Sunday of the month. Um, you can watch it live, you can participate, you can invite as many people as you want to your house to watch the live stream. Uh, and next, in two weeks, we're going to be interviewing Joycelyn Buckner for our members only um, session. She uh, grew up uh, eight years old playing um, in Joshua Tree, learning all about the Integratron time machine. She has tons of information that I've never heard and seen and read, and I've read a lot about that. So she's going to really give us the inside scoop. She's going to talk about giant rocks. She's going to talk about um, the um, Native Americans as well, um, and how the rock was split using prayer and meditation, which is crazy when you see a picture of giant rock. She's also going to teach us how to see a UFO. So you're, if you're interested in time travel and the work of these scientists, um, we invite you out. Uh, and we'll see you next Thursday is Alan's start of his big series. The first session is free. So that's your chance to get on. Nick, Nick Pope, JJ Hertog are going to talk about the latest disclosures and how that interfaces with human consciousness. So JJ, Desiree Hertog, there, it's it's going to be a breakthrough session. Okay. Thank you so much, you guys. Have a wonderful night. Thanks, uh, thanks for speaking your truth um, and spreading the word about this and having experiences in your life. So we'll see you uh, at uh, in Utah and online. Thank you. Thanks again, Dwayne and Carl. Thanks, everyone.